During my sportscasting days, uh, we used to comment on um, stadiums that were either empty or only half full, and we would make the comment that uh, looks like a lot of fans disguised as empty seats here tonight. <laughs> We're glad you're here for the optional session. Uh, we always like to say the group that shows up for the optional session, this is the elect. Is, uh, <laughs> so. Well, please welcome um, Dr. Derek Thomas, who is pastor of First Presbyterian Church, Columbia, South Carolina, <laughs> along with my pastor, Dr. Burke Parsons, who is senior pastor at St. Andrew's Chapel. Gentlemen, thank you for this time. We often say, and you hear us say on Renewing Your Mind as well as our other resources, that Ligonier Ministries exist to proclaim, teach, and defend the holiness of God in all its fullness to as many people as possible. But we do that within the context of the local church. Burke, I've heard you say a number of times, and Dr. Thomas as well, that we do not exist to replace the church. We see our role as to come alongside the church, even to undergird the church with the kinds of resources that God has blessed us to, to produce and distribute around the world. It was the local church where I first heard about Dr. R.C. Sproul. I walked into a church with my wife, I wouldn't have known what Calvinism was, didn't know what predestination was. Uh, my theology was probably a quarter inch deep. All I knew was that we were not hearing the Bible at the church that we had been going to for many years. The Bible was not preached. But that first Sunday, we went to the adult Sunday school class and they were showing a video. They hauled in, now this was 1990, so you'll relate to this. They hauled in this video monitor that uh, with a VHS machine, they plugged it in and this guy popped up and my wife immediately said, that guy looks like Columbo, doesn't he? And I said, yeah, he does. And I knew as R.C. Sproul, Sproul, I couldn't remember what his name was, but what I knew at the end of that presentation was this man was teaching things that I needed to hear. And the pastor of that church who had been a student of Dr. Sproul's uh, in seminary uh, later gave me a copy of a magazine called Table Talk. And uh, so I've never looked back, but I've always appreciated the fact that it was in the context of the local church that I was first exposed to this kind of teaching from Ligonier Ministries. So in light of that, it's, it's a privilege to be able to host this panel discussion with Dr. Thomas and Dr. Parsons about preaching and pastoral ministry. And so we're, we're glad you're here for that. And I'd like to start by talking about two different exhortations, one from the Apostle Paul, when he said, he told his, his protege, Timothy, Guard, by the Holy Spirit, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. What, does, what did Paul mean by that, and how does this exhortation inform your ministry today? You're looking at me? Um, it's wonderful to be here, and uh, especially to be with my dear friend, uh, Burke, Parsons, and um, I was never as good looking as Burke ever, not even when I was his age. Um, I, I think there's probably uh, a big picture and, and a specific picture when, when Paul uses the word deposit. You know, what, when you think of a deposit, you think of guarding something that's precious. You think of guarding say, a wedding ring or a crock of gold or some cash or, or something. Uh, and, and what is that? And, and we, I think we could colloquially say it is the faith, to guard the faith. But more specifically, I think Paul, Paul is saying to Timothy, there are certain core elemental truths to the gospel that he is to guard and protect because they are the life spring of the church. And, and, and it's his swan song. So once Paul is gone and, and Timothy uh, becomes the heir apparent, um, he is to continue ministry uh, in the local church 
employing this, this deposit, these core fundamental truths, uh, without which there is no gospel, without which there is no church um, life. So, on one level, I think it is uh, a call uh, to protect and, and keep safe the truth of Scripture. Uh, I, I, think, I think by saying the deposit, he, he may have in mind the entirety of Scripture, but, but I, I think he probably has in mind those specific truths that are core to the gospel and, and guard and protect them. I mean, it's an exhortation that's as valid today, right now, 21st century uh, America as, as it was in, in Paul's day. And I think the, um, the language there of guarding this deposit and trust it to him is that it didn't belong to him. Uh, it belongs to God. It's his truth, his word, his gospel, his scripture. And, and I think that's an important thing that we all need to hear, we all need to know, but especially pastors. Uh, we need to be reminded regularly that, um, that what has been entrusted to us doesn't belong to us. That's the same with our families, same with our wives, our children. They're not really ours. They belong to God. They've been entrusted to us for a time, and so we are to be faithful stewards. Um, it's not my truth. It's not my pulpit. It's not even ultimately my ministry. It's all God's, and we are called to be faithful stewards of it. So I think there's an aspect there that, you know, we see throughout the, throughout the Bible, but uh, something that I always want to remind myself of, and it can be taken away. And I think the Lord loves to show that the church belongs to Him and not to any man. When a man puffs himself up with pride and arrogance and pomposity, the Lord loves to just bring him down to his knees, perhaps bring him back to himself, and show him that uh, this ministry and this deposit never really belonged to him in the first place. Burke, I've heard you talk about uh, the weight of the robe that you wear every Sunday preaching. And Dr. Thomas, I know you wear a robe as well. Are you reminded all the time of the great responsibility you have with regard to guarding the good deposit? It doesn't get lighter as you get older, for sure. And um, I mean, this is attributed to several people and, and some Scottish Presbyterians for sure, but um, there's a shadow that you cast when you walk up those steps into the pulpit and it, it casts a shadow on the wall uh, behind. And um, I mean, I have a dear friend who's uh, been a preacher for 60 years or so, now, now retired, but still preaching on a very regular basis. And he was very ambitious when he was young, uh, in a good sense, you know, but with all of the moral tragedies that happened so frequently in, in our time, I remember him saying to me, and this would have been 20 years ago, um, you know, now I just want to finish the course w without tragedy. And, and I feel that, because um, every time I read one of these stories, you know, there go I, but for the grace of God. For sure. Mm. The other exhortation comes from Peter, who says, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. How does Peter's exhortation inform your ministry today? Well, let me give you a personal illustration. I grew up on a sheep farm. Uh, my father was a shepherd, and um, I remember I would have been I would have been 10, 11 years old, dead of winter, snowing, blizzard. Um, lambs were coming, uh, and sheep, for some crazy reason, would, would go up high into the hills to give birth. Uh, and we would get on a tractor and, and make our way to the top of this hill uh, with a couple of sheepdogs to find the, the sheep. And he would, he would and they'd be frozen, these little lambs, and he'd put them inside his, his coat, one in here and one inside here. And, and um, 
he would you know bring it down and we had a, we had one of these old fashioned uh, Rayburn ovens coal fired oven on one side a warming drawer not an oven but a warm very important to understand this wasn't the oven this was a warming drawer down below and he would put the little lambs in the warming drawer he would give them some milk and 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 He'd add a few drops of whiskey to the milk. And within seconds, those little tails would start wriggling and, and, and they would recover. Um, but I'm often reminded of that scene, and I, 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 this, is, this is 60 years ago in my memory, but I'm reminded of just how personal shepherding ministry can become it's relatively easy, it's not easy, but it's relatively easy to be a shepherd in the pulpit, and, and you have to be a shepherd in the pulpit. Um, but going after the individual lambs and sheep, particularly now for me in a, a, in a large congregation uh, where I don't even know the names of some of them, uh, that, that's the challenge for me. Yeah, there's a tremendous amount in that passage, as you know, Lee. Um, and uh, I think I think a few things I just want to mention. Um, that again, it says the flock of God. We we as pastors we have a tendency to refer to the congregation as our congregation, our flock. I don't think that's inappropriate at all, because in one sense, of course, they are. But we have to always remember that ultimately they belong to God. These are God's people, God's sheep. This is the flock of God. And again, a stewardship there. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about that passage is that Peter, you know, speaks of himself as a fellow elder. He doesn't lift himself up. He doesn't, doesn't suggest that he has some hierarchical role, some greater role of authority. He certainly doesn't suggest that he's some sort of vicar of Christ or pope. He's just a fellow elder exhorting other elders. And I love the humility there uh, in, in Peter's tone. And then and then over and over again, I think three times in that, in verses one through five, we see the language of among you. Shepherd the flock of God among you. That, that infers that the shepherd is among the sheep. Because the reality of it is, is that even though we are shepherds, we are under shepherds to Christ who is the chief shepherd, but we're also sheep ourselves. And that's the most difficult part. And quite frankly, though most people don't realize it, Pastors are in many ways just as needy sheep as everyone else in the church, and that's why we have to have our pastors and our elders and our fraternities and friends um, to be around us. Um, another thing I'll just want to point out quickly that I think is very important, something we don't talk about to the degree that I think we should in the church, and that is the fact that the work of the pastor, and I'm sure you're familiar with the word pastor and how the, it's really the same word for shepherd, the poimen, I think, in the Greek. Uh, and that word is, is the word, of course, used for the office of pastor. We never hear the word preacher used as an office. Preachers are to be pastors who shepherd God's people and one of the chief ways by which they do that is through preaching and teaching. But I think it's very important that we always remember that, that pastors are shepherds. Preaching is not, a preacher is not an office in the church. Uh, there's a place for preachers, there's a place for itinerant preachers, there's a place for those to go and to preach the Word of God and preach the gospel of God, but fundamentally the office is that of shepherd. And I think we need to remember that, and I think Peter well understood that, being that Christ told him. Feed you my been, sheep. You've been preaching over the last few weeks on John chapter 10 and Christ being the good shepherd. And how, it, it, how has that shaped uh, your thinking about uh, this office of, of pastor? Well, I mean, John chapter 10, as we all know, is a, just a, such a rich and beautiful chapter. I think we're on Sunday, Lord willing, we'll be on part 12, and I'm planning to finish the chapter on Sunday. Uh, because there's so much there, but one of the things we see there is Christ's compassion, um, His compassion for His sheep, His care for His sheep. Like Derek talked about going after the wandering sheep. You know, we, we hear Jesus speak about going after the one. 
that's just so beautiful. I mean, he's, in one sense, He's come after all of us when we were wandering from Him mm. um, in our sin. And He came to us and He took us to Himself, but laying His life down. And, and again, we, we, we immediately go to Jesus would be willing to die for us, and He did. But it's so much more than that. As, as, a, as, a, as a shepherd boy, and a son of a shepherd, your father didn't just die for the sheep. He wasn't just willing to die for them. He had to live for them. Mm. And that's what Jesus did for us. He lived. He's lived for us. And um, the language is so rich when it comes to shepherding. But I think also we have to recognize as pastors is that we're not Jesus and that we're not omniscient, we're not omnipotent, um, and that we are but mere men. And it's also something that we need to regularly remind the people we serve of the same point, that we are not Jesus. Jesus is your great shepherd. He is your chief shepherd, and ultimately, He's the chief shepherd of each and every one of our local churches. Both of you pastor large churches. Dr. Thomas, you mentioned that, and uh, how important are elders uh, and deacons in this business of shepherding the flock? Well, they're important in the sense that they're biblical. Um, uh, church polity in the New Testament is, is very clear uh, that there are deacons and elders. Uh, I have been in uh, churches where uh, there were four or five elders, and, and they were there until they died, uh, and, and appointing a new elder was fairly rare. Uh, I'm now in a church where we have rotating elders. They're, they're always elders, but they don't, they don't sit on session. We, we currently have 46. We'll have 48 next year. Um, but there are probably 100 elders in the congregation. And... Uh, uh, in, you know, part of the part of the difficulties we have uh, in, at least in Presbyterian circles, is that elders, especially in a congregation that's not a blue-collar congregation, uh, elders tend to be doctors and lawyers and successful businessmen. Uh, with families and wives and children and, and so on, and they're extraordinarily busy, and one of the reasons they're successful is because they're busy, and that, that means they have little time. And, and so the tendency in our circles is that the session, the elders, are more CEO of a large corporation. Um, I mean, our church employs 60, 70 people. It's like a small business. It's a multi-million dollar small business uh, with, with a board. Um, and I'm not, I'm not criticizing that. I think that's just the fact. That's, I'm, de I'm describing what is. And for 40 years, um, I have seen both in in a church where there were four elders to a church where there's a hundred elders, it is still difficult to equally divide the role of shepherding um, between all of the elders and all of the congregations. I've, I've, I've seen all of the, the ways of doing that, dividing, giving each elder X number of families with a, 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 to check after them. But there are all kinds of complications. In the South, in, in, in South Carolina, uh, to call on the whim and knock the door and say, I'm the elder, I'm coming to see you, there would be a heart attack. They need the cleaners to come in before, before you can go in. And if the senior minister did that, they would be horrified. So, so the very technical, I mean, in Belfast, I could just knock on a door. I'd go in, I'd spend a couple of hours, I'd get a cup of tea, I'd ask them some spiritual questions. It was a pastoral visit, and it was expected. Those days are gone. Uh, I don't think they ever came in South Carolina, but they're certainly not there right now. So one has to, one has to think of more inventive ways of exactly how do you shepherd these, these individuals and, and keep touch with them. 
And I'm, I'm not averse. I mean, I, I do a lot of texting with a lot of members just to, just to keep in touch. Um, if, if something happens to an individual and it appears on a, on a pastoral report for that day, I'll, you know, you, you try to get in touch with them. But it doesn't necessarily mean a knock on the door and a heart attack. It's, it's a verse of Scripture praying for you. Let me know how I can help you. But Peter's exhortation is to exercise oversight. And for some, that means you've gone to meddling. <laughs> so how do, you, how do you navigate that with, with members who may need the kind of oversight that Peter is talking about here? And, and, and I guess where, where does the elder come into that as, as well? Well, for us, and I think it was the same in the church that I was in in Jackson, uh, there is a committee, a pastoral care committee made up of elders uh, in league with the deacons because some of that shepherding care has material issues that the deacons need to also address. And, and there are, you know, there are cases of crisis, there are cases of discipline, uh, there are cases of, of care. Um, there is the oversight of widows and, and folk who are passing through particular difficult seasons. And it's a combination of not just, I mean, not just the elders, but, but the pastors, the teaching elders too are involved in that, in that pastoral care ministry. But it's, I've never been in, an, in, a, in a time when I think we did that perfectly, never. Um, we're, all, we're always in a position where how can we do this mm -hmm. better, for sure. Mm -hmm. I, um, I'll just add just briefly that I think it's important that we recognize that there is an aspect of oversight and care for souls. Um, we, have, we have to give an account to God, we read in Hebrews, and um, we are... We are caring for souls, and that's why there's oversight. Same with a parent who has oversight of, of, of her child. Um, they have that oversight because they're responsible for the care of their soul. And, uh, and that's what people need to be reminded of, that when they come into the church, I mean, we have a whole, you know, movement now of people who don't even believe in joining a church and becoming a member of the church. And uh, I think that's very sad because I think it's a, just a poor understanding of the hermeneutics of, of the New Testament in particular. But um, that membership and that, that relationship and that connection and that oversight is really just an extension of God's oversight of us. And, uh, but we just have to be careful never to abuse that authority, right. never to overstep our authority. We were talking about something just a little bit ago, and uh, I said I'm not going to give my comment on that or my opinion on it. Um, and uh, that's one of the ways, by the way, that's one of the ways your pastor keeps his job by not giving his opinion on everything <laughs> out there. And um, because the truth is, is that a lot of times our opinions, they really have no bearing whatsoever on the job that we're called to do in exercising oversight. And so even this past year, I've chosen not to give my opinion on a whole host of matters, as you know, Lee, because I realize that's not really my job fundamentally. I have no problem with other pastors who've done that, but... Um, I'm just going to kind of keep focused. and I think when you get to be as old as Derek, though, you can give your opinions. And <laughs> Well, that, that's a good transition to what may be our last question and answer. But uh, both of you teach, you teach full-time at, at uh, Reform Seminary in Atlanta. It's, it's more part-time these days. More part-time. Yeah. And, and Dr. Parsons, I know you have uh, taught some as well uh, and some a little bit. Um, what, is your, what is your advice to young seminarians who uh, are entering the pastoral ministry? What, and I, I, I might also ask it, in this context that what would you go back and tell Derek Thomas, the seminarian, that after all these years of pastoring? Um, I actually had a seminary education that I still think was a good one. I mean, I, th there, were, there were bits here and there 
um, that that weren't great, but I still have a very fond and positive memory of the seminary education that I got uh, at RTS back in the 70s. Um, and now I teach, you know, and I'm, I'm 68, so I'm teaching typically students that are in their mid to late 20s, early 30s, married, usually with two or three kids. And I'm just awed by the fact that there are so many of them. Um, God, God seems to be working on the hearts of young men today as much as, and perhaps more than, in, when I was at seminary, uh, there's no end to the supply of young men who, who really want to minister for the Lord. Um, and I don't want, you know, they, they, they have zeal. They have lots of zeal, and they have lots of confidence, Some, sometimes too much confidence. But, but, and I don't want to put the fire out. I don't want to be the old guy who says, you know, my day, blah, blah, blah. Um, I, I, I want to encourage them. And they will fall on their faces, you know, without me telling them that they're going to fall on their faces, and, and they're, they're, going to, they're going to mess up. But I, I see it as my role to encourage them to, to persevere. But I, I do think that in our age, we live in a, in a peculiarly... Um, an age of peculiar temptation where m many, many, many ministers fail to reach the end. And, and ensuring that they are uh, honest and loyal and faithful to their wives and families, that they have a sense of accountability uh, to a group of people that they trust um, so that they finish the race well, which is way in the future for them. Uh, and, and that has become my sort of burden as I, as I m mix with folk that are, that are young enough to be my children, to be honest. You first asked the question, Lee, uh, what would you tell them in seminary and if they're wanting to pursue the pastorate? I would, my first thought is don't. Um, I think there, there are a lot of men very ambitious and, and, and um, very zealous. And sometimes they, they get zealous about theology and they think because they get excited about theology that means they are called to the pastorate and that's just not the case, of course. Um, I think the church, the seminary can't really do this, but the church needs to make sure it has very clear criteria that it uses because just because a man is in seminary doesn't mean he should be in the pastorate. Just because a man is graduated from seminary doesn't mean he should be in the pastorate. And both the church and the presbytery or whatever the outside uh, authoritative structure is of, of the church and denomination. Um, I think we actually need to, we need to be very careful because there are men who need to be encouraged. There are men who need to be, need to just be encouraged to press on and keep going. But there, there are a lot of men who I think have been encouraged by the wrong people. Uh, you know, a sweet lady came up in the church and said, you're, you're a great preacher. You should be a pastor. Just because someone's a great communicator does not mean he should be a pastor. And I think, I think we have, we have, we have not really fully recognized the significance of the call. And I think that's one of the reasons we're seeing so many pastors leave the pastorate, so many pastors burn out from the pastorate, and so many just move on to something else because they may not have actually ever really been called to be a pastor to begin with. And so the elders of the church really need to take this very, very seriously um, and, and really, really try to identify based on, on what we understand from Scripture, what men really are not only qualified, but equipped and truly called. And that takes several years to determine that. You can't really determine that within a year-long or two-year-long internship. Yeah. It typically takes longer than that. And I will just say this lastly. A lot of times, the men that are not that confident in themselves, who don't necessarily exhibit immediate uh, 
tremendous gifting in speaking or in leading, sometimes those men who are humble men who love the Lord, sometimes those are going to be the best pastors out there because they know they can't do it. They know they're not capable in themselves. They know that they don't really have a whole lot to offer, but God is doing something in them. And so I want to look for that, that humble man who does not think too highly of himself, who just wants to serve the Lord and doesn't know what that's going to look like. Those are often the men that I have seen become the most faithful pastors that serve to the end. Again, would you join me in thanking Dr. Burke Parsons and Dr. Derek Thomas. Thank you, men.